here's the list of representative geniuses for today's lecture. Although only about a dozen pictures are universally attributed to Leonardo, two of them, The Last Supper and Mona Lisa, are probably the best known pictures in the history of art. But we'll also hear about a lot of other things that he did, and to hear about him as, if not exactly a scientist in the modern sense, at least as what Kenneth Clark calls the most relentlessly curious man in history. Josquin Dupre was the man their contemporaries called the Michelangelo of music, the greatest composer of the whole Renaissance in Europe, and we'll hear several things by him this afternoon. Machiavelli's name brings to mind amorality and the glorification of winning at any cost, but his masterpiece, The Prince, is in fact a penetrating psychological analysis of the history of politics, and especially Renaissance politics. Ghirlandaio is a painter who is not now very highly regarded, but he was very successful and he was the teacher of Michelangelo. We won't hear much about Michelangelo today, but he'll be the main subject next week. Well then, at the end of the last program, I was talking about the apprenticeship Leonardo served in the workshop of Andrea del Verrocchio, a workshop which I suggested was probably just the right place for him, considering that it turned out all sorts of things, from stone and metal statuary to jewelry, cabinetry, and of course, paintings. It was a place where he could learn the fundamental manufacturing technique required for all sorts of projects. Although he probably painted part of the baptism that we saw last time, this Annunciation, now in the Uffizi Gallery, is usually considered his earliest surviving complete work. It was painted about 1472, when he would have been about 20 years old. Its unusual shape, it's about 7 feet long and 3 feet high, has yet to be satisfactorily explained, but it certainly made for something of a compositional challenge, and even apart from that, Leonardo had himself obvious problems with various parts of the picture. He repainted the angel's wings, and the virgin's right arm seems too long, maybe by, in terms of scale, a couple of feet for the rest of her body. She has her hand raised as though surprised by the angel's message, but her face really has no expression on it at all. Her appearance has more in common with the blank look of most 15th century portraits than with uh, Mona Lisa, still 30 years in the future. Here's the angel up close now. Leonardo never painted anything on a sunny day, and the dawn or dusk lighting he almost always uses lends a kind of romantic quality to his subject. Walter Pater said that the essence of romanticism is beauty touched with strangeness, and I think that description fits the angel here. As well as perhaps the whole picture, Leonardo is going to give more importance to the effect landscape can produce in creating the right mood for a subject than any painter before him. And that emphasis is also a feature of what's come to be called the romantic in art. The way the angel is silhouetted against the dark trees produces the effect called chiaroscuro, the dramatic contrast between light and dark, making it seem like the figure is either spotlit or glowing. Caravaggio is the painter usually said to have made the most of this device, but it's a, a device which Leonardo was himself really among the very first to use. The fact that he was at the cutting edge in the use of such things as lighting and landscape makes it natural to compare him with the artists of the future rather than with those of the past with those he influenced rather than with those who influenced him. This is the Virgin and Child with Flowers in the Munich Alta Pinacotech, which Kenneth Clark calls a charmless picture with all the unpleasant vitality of immature genius. The most charmless thing in it is the baby Jesus, which is certainly one of the most charmless infants ever painted by a great artist, I suppose this is irrelevant, but Giotto, one of the few real family men among great Renaissance artists, paints the infants who seem to me to be the most appealing in the whole period. <laughs> 
The landscape here, however, is again a high point of the picture. It's a beautiful alpine scene of the sort Leonardo seems to have liked best, but almost certainly hadn't seen himself by the time this was painted. The date ascribed to this is 1473, when Leonardo probably painted it in Verrocchio's studio for some unknown customer. The use of oil here again is one of the things that connects the picture to Leonardo. Vasari says the oil painting technique was invented by Van Eyck in Flanders in the early 15th century and brought to Italy by Antonello da Messina, who took up residence in Venice because of all the loose women there. Venice was, in fact, to be the place where oil painting first became widely popular in Italy, but oil was, in fact, a medium known to Italian painters at least as early as the 14th century. It is also true, however, that oil painting was much more popular at an earlier date north of the Alps, and early Italian commentators like Gino Cennini and Alberti do refer to it as a German medium. This portrait of Ginevra Benci was painted by Leonardo about 1475 and was purchased by the Washington National Gallery in 1967 for five million dollars, a record at the time. It's the only generally accepted painting by Leonardo in the United States. This is perhaps her wedding portrait, but if it is, I've seen happier brides. There's a distinct melancholy about the whole picture, which is in keeping with the subject's expression. And there is expression here, even if the appearance is close to the characteristic blank look of the 15th century portraits and of the Virgin in the Annunciation we saw earlier. She's like the angel in the Annunciation also in being spotlit or glowing against a dark background. In her case, supplied by a juniper bush, which is a clue to her identity since Juniper, Ginepro in Italian, is close to Ginevra. She's certainly another beauty touched with strangeness, like that angel too. The eyes, which are as big as her mouth, are very far apart and without lashes, a not uncommon touch among 15th century fashionistas. The three-quarter profile format is a foreshadowing of Mona Lisa, and if the missing bottom one-third of this picture were still present, we would probably be reminded even more of La Gioconda. The landscape is not of the mountainous sort that Leonardo especially liked and which forms the background of Mona Lisa, but it's very poetic in its own way. Some liken the atmosphere of Leonardo's landscapes to that of classical Chinese ones of approximately the same period, but I think they're typically more in the European romantic vein than like anything Chinese. This is a landscape sketch which Leonardo dated 1473. It's sometimes called the first pure landscape in European art. Pure meaning that there are no human figures in it. I think this claim might have to have an asterisk by it though, because I think he just did it for fun, or as something more like a scientific observation perhaps than as a work of art. As an independent work of art, it would have been regarded as very avant-garde. People would have said, as they said about abstract paintings in the 50s, I don't get it. What's it supposed to mean? It would have been regarded as a stage set with no actors. Still, it is a pure landscape, and one could argue that anything Leonardo drew is ipso facto a work of art. You should notice that the text with the date is written backwards at the upper left. The name at the lower right was added later. In fact, almost everything he wrote was written backwards. Some have thought he got started doing this to conceal his controversial ideas, but if Leonardo da Vinci had really wanted to conceal his ideas, a man of his genius could have come up with a better code than this. Since he was apparently left-handed, he may have written this way to avoid smearing the wet ink. It may be that he just did this backward writing for fun, too. He spent a lot of time making very complex doodles, and this seems like a possible manifestation of that propensity.
another drawing he made about the same time. In writing about painting, Leonardo says that the first inspiration is always the best, and he says that he liked to draw on colored paper so that he couldn't erase anything. The colored paper of the day would itself be marred by erasures. That he made this study without erasing anything is about as much evidence for his technical ability as anyone could want. There's been a popular movement lately to sort of deconstruct genius, to argue that geniuses aren't really any different than the rest of us, just basically possessed of different opportunities, but this is plainly psychosocial egalitarianism at its silliest. It's not even an interesting issue to argue about. It's worth pointing out that this is unfinished, like a lot of Leonardo's work. It seems to me that it sort of follows, from what Leonardo says about the first inspiration being the best, that if you're not inspired, you should just stop. Here Leonardo got as far as the shoulders, uh, you see, ran out of inspiration, put the head in three different places, still without erasing anything, and then just quit. Some artists try to make hard work substitute for inspiration, but not Leonardo. If he's not inspired, that's the end of it. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but it does, I think, help explain a lot of things in Leonardo's career. <laughs> This St. Jerome, now in the Vatican Museum, was found in 1900 being used as a tabletop in a Rome antique warehouse and is now universally accepted as an early work by Leonardo, in part because of its resemblance to the adoration by him, which we'll see in a minute. Both got only as far as the underpainting, which was done in bist or charcoal mixed with oil, a favorite underpainting medium of Leonardo's. It's not known for what purpose this might have been painted, but Jerome was one of the most popular saints of the Renaissance, in which he was viewed as an example of a good Christian who was nevertheless devoted to the classics. Although it's true he felt he had to punish himself for reading pagans like Cicero, hitting himself with a rock as he's shown doing here. The lion he befriended is another thing by which he can be recognized. This is the similarly unfinished Adoration of the Magi, now in the Uffizi Gallery, which Leonardo was commissioned to paint apparently for the monastery of San Donato. This and the Saint Jerome are probably the earliest surviving works by Leonardo as an independent businessman after he had left Verrocchio's studio. It's not certain exactly when he did leave, but by the time he did these pictures he was probably close to 30 years old. This picture is sometimes said to be the first representation of the adoration arranged in what became a common way with the virgin at the top of a kind of triangle or kind of pyramidal arrangement in the composition of the subjects. But I pointed out last time that Botticelli's version of the adoration is earlier than this and even has figures standing at the lower left and right corners of the triangle in the way Leonardo has positioned such figures here. What really must have impressed people about this, though, is the dramatic gesturing and action that swirls around the center. Here's the center of the picture up closer now. This painting, like several others by Leonardo, we'll see, was cleaned and restored several years ago, but I think it's fair to say that no major discoveries were made as a result of this. Kenneth Clark says that Leonardo's adoration is a kind of overture to what was to come in his career. The pointing finger there will show up in about a half a dozen of his pictures. There are 11 horses in this, and he'll be fascinated by horses his whole life and try to cast the largest one ever in bronze, and I think the Last Supper is prefigured in the row of angels, if that's what they're supposed to be above the Virgin's head. Why he again left a major work unfinished isn't clear. 
But Kenneth Clark says it would have taxed even Leonardo's genius to have tried to go farther with this without depriving it of magic. Maybe he just felt that, as a work of art, if not as a proper altarpiece, this was the best he could do with it, and so again he just stopped. Here are the fellows to the lower right. And again, thinking back to Botticelli's version and where Botticelli stands in that picture, it may be, say some, that we have a self-portrait by Leonardo in the corresponding place here. Another thing one might notice is the lack of a halo for the Virgin, at least up to this point in Leonardo's work. And he also leaves her haloless in later completed representations. I said in the last lecture that Botticelli's Virgin in the Uffizi Adoration also lacks one, but there is actually one, in fact, so faint as to be visible essentially only with a magnifying glass. This kind of emotional expression is rare in 15th century art and is, as is often the case in his work, a foreshadowing of something really Baroque rather than a reflection of what was typically Renaissance. It is possible that he meant actually to finish it. Vasari says that in 1482 he was commissioned by Lorenzo de' Medici to take a lyre. Leonardo was also a talented musician. As a gift to Ludovico Sforza in Milan, and he may have expected to return. The monks who commissioned this altarpiece didn't hire anyone else to replace Leonardo's work for 15 years, apparently thinking he would come back to work on it more. But he never did. He apparently liked Milan, and at the age of 30, his career in Florence was going nowhere. He had a reputation for being unreliable and had been accused of homosexuality. It was time for a change. This is a portrait of Ludovico Sforza, known as Il Moro, the Moor, apparently because of his dark complexion. He was the son of Francesco Sforza, about whom we've heard as the builder of the Castello Sforcesco and as the founder of the Sforza dynasty in Milan. Ludovico had taken over when his older brother, Galeazzo Maria, was assassinated on the steps of the cathedral in 1476, leaving behind an infant son, Gian Galeazzo, as heir for whom Uncle Ludovico here was supposed to act as regent, but who probably had him poisoned when he reached adulthood and wanted to be Duke himself. It's not certain who painted the altarpiece, of which this is a detail, but it wasn't Leonardo. When he decided he wanted to stay in Milan, Leonardo submitted a sort of resume to Ludovico, which includes a long list of things he might be able to do for his Ducal Highness, he says, and this is a paraphrase, that he can build strong and light bridges. He knows how to build all kinds of battering rams. He says he knows a method for demolishing fortresses. He says he can make a kind of bombard which will hurl showers of small stones and the smoke of which will strike terror into the enemy. He says he knows how to build covered wagons, sort of like tanks, I guess, behind which whole armies could hide in advance. He also says that in time of peace, he believes himself able to buy successfully with any in the designing of public and private buildings and in conducting water from one place to another. He says he can also carry out sculpture in marble and bronze, and he says, in painting, I can do as well as any man. It's significant, of course, that what Leonardo emphasizes in this are his skills in military technology and engineering, and that the fact that he can paint is mentioned almost as an afterthought. A resume must, of course, take into account the likely requirements of an employer, and Leonardo evidently knew that tanks and machine guns would be of more interest to Ludovico than objet d'art alone. Some of Leonardo's biographers complain that Ludovico wasted his talent. Leonardo was to spend 19 years in Milan, and only maybe half a dozen paintings from that period or anything like unanimously attributed to him from it. But Leonardo himself never complained in any surviving document about this. 
He was to be essentially an all-purpose handyman and to work on everything from stage sets and ladies' dresses and jewelry to plumbing, armor, and, of course, the Last Supper. Nowhere does he complain. Oh, darn, I wanted to paint a masterpiece today, but I had to fix the toilet. Although its date is not certain, the earliest surviving painting from Leonardo's Milan period, it's now in Krakow, is perhaps this portrait of Ludovico's mistress, Cecilia Gallerani. She was Ludovico's mistress at the time Leonardo arrived and remained in that position after the Duke's marriage to Beatrice d'Este in 1491, before eventually disappearing from history. The fact that the ermine in the picture was used as a symbol by Ludovico, and also the fact that the Greek word for ermine is gale, suggesting Gallerani, make it certainly likely that this is Cecilia Gallerani. And we know that Leonardo did paint her portrait, so the question is whether or not this is the original or a copy. Kenneth Clark says that this is the original, Will Durant says it's not, but Kenneth Clark is much more of a Leonardo authority than Durant. It's interesting that one of the pieces of evidence that Leonardo painted Cecilia's portrait is a letter from her to Isabella de Este, who had asked that it be sent to her. Isabella was the sister of Ludovico's wife, Beatrice, and it doesn't seem like she should have been very friendly with Ludovico's mistress, Cecilia, but Isabella was also known as a very aggressive collector. Cecilia didn't send the picture, however, saying it no longer looked like her, and the date of the letter, 1498, is probably at least 15 years post the painting of the portrait, so that seems reasonable. But maybe she just wanted an excuse not to give it away. Here it is up closer. Some think she didn't like the picture. It's been suggested that maybe she thought she resembled the ermine a bit too much, which does look kind of weasel-like. Since we know that Leonardo did things like fashion design when he was in Milan, Cecilia might actually, I think, be wearing a Mr. Leonardo here. The kind of decoration on her right shoulder, which would be called pinstriping if it were on a 57 Chevy, is typical of the kind of geometrical doodling that often shows up in Leonardo's drawings. This is the picture in the Louvre called La Belle Ferronniere on the old mistaken assumption that it represented Henry II's mistress by that name. But some think it is Leonardo's portrait of Ludovico's mistress named Lucrezia Crivelli. Kenneth Clark thinks this is by Leonardo. Durant thinks it might be. Bernard Berenson says he hopes it's not, although he too thinks it might be. Berenson thinks it's sort of too cutesy and pouty, but cutesy and pouty is the way a mistress is supposed to look, isn't it? Since she didn't become Ludovico's mistress till something like 1495 at the earliest, this was probably painted about the time Leonardo was working on The Last Supper, given that he, he did this portrait at all. And The Last Supper is just about as different a sort of thing as one could imagine, but geniuses are versatile. <laughs> This is another portrait now in the Ambrosian Library in Milan, which is sometimes attributed to Leonardo. The identity of the subject is itself controversial. Some think she is Bianca Maria Sforza, the niece of Ludovico, who married the Emperor Maximilian. If that's who she is, he was a lucky fellow to be married to two of the most beautiful girls of his day. His first wife was the equally beautiful Mary of Burgundy, whom we'll see and hear about in the fall. Some think this might be a picture of Beatrice, Ludovico's wife, but any identification is just a guess. The pinstriping on the shoulder again suggests at least Leonardo's influence, perhaps, but despite the beauty of the subject, 
This comes across as really a very ordinary portrait that, as Kenneth Clark says, one can hardly imagine is actually the work of Leonardo. Although maybe it's like Somerset Mom says, only mediocre people are always at their best. This is a portrait of Bianca Maria by Leonardo's colleague in Milan, Ambrogio de Predis, and it doesn't look much like the same subject. I might say that de Predis is also often given credit for the previous picture. This is a drawing now generally attributed to Leonardo, which sold in 1998 for $21,000 before this attribution by Martin Kemp primarily, which has made it worth probably a hundred million today, there isn't time to go into details about all the reasons for the new attribution, but one visible thing is the shading, which is of, of the sort natural to a left-handed person, upper left to lower right. This would be unnatural for a right-handed person, and Leonardo was almost certainly left-handed. Whoever she is, she's become known, thanks to Professor Kemp, as the Bella Principessa. Several of Leonardo's pictures have fingerprints like this one, and attempts have been made to match them up, but uh, the jury is still out on that. This is the Louvre version of the Madonna of the Rocks, which Kenneth Clark thinks was actually painted by Leonardo in Florence and taken with him to Milan to bolster the claim in his resume that he could paint as well as anyone. We know that Leonardo was commissioned to paint a picture like this after his arrival in Milan, but Sir Kenneth thinks that that picture is the version of the subject which is now in the London National Gallery. In any case, the consensus is that this is the superior picture of the two. The subjects are arranged in a kind of peculiar way, with Jesus at the lower right blessing the infant John the Baptist under Mary's arm in what would seem the more important place at the upper left to her right. It's often said that the pointing finger of the angel above the head of Jesus and Mary's hand above it do draw attention to Jesus but I don't think this works. Tourists still make the mistake of supposing John is Jesus. The setting is again one that suggests Leonardo's romantic side. It looks like the event is taking place in some alpine grotto beside a distant lake. The picture also depends for its atmosphere on the lighting, the chiaroscuro, the contrast between light and dark, which is not as evident in this photograph as it is in the original. In addition to being one of the first artists to use light this way, Leonardo also is the man, Kenneth Clark says, as I mentioned last time in connection with Botticelli, the first to think of painting as something other than the filling in of an outline. He uses a technique known as sfumato, which means something like smoky. In this close-up of the Virgin's face, there's a clear contrast to the much more linear, outline-filling style of his contemporaries like Botticelli and Mantegna. To some extent, this is probably made easier by Leonardo's use of oil rather than tempera, but the difference is more, I think, due to just the different approach he takes. This is the other version of the Madonna of the Rocks, the one in the London National Gallery, and Kenneth Clark, as well as most other authorities now, thinks that this is the picture painted to satisfy the commission of 1483 after he was in Milan. Why the confraternity which wanted this didn't just buy the Louvre version isn't clear. Although most authorities think there is enough of Leonardo in it to justify the attribution, most don't think this picture is, however, more than partially Leonardo's work. For one thing, the misty haze, the sfumato that seems to envelop the other picture, is absent here, and the parts of the picture are much more clearly outlined. Also, the effect of the chiaroscuro is something more like harsh than poetic or romantic. There are, of course, differences in the composition itself as well, though these differences don't in themselves mean Leonardo wasn't responsible for them. <laughs> 
This is the 15th century church of Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan, built mostly by Guinaforte Solari, with a dome by Donato Bramante, about whom we'll hear more as the original architect of the new St. Peter's in Rome. This church was attached to a Dominican convent at the time it was built, and this was one of Beatrice Sforza's favorite places, and it may well be that she was instrumental in having her husband Ludovico order a new painting for the refectory of this convent from Leonardo. The convent's all gone except for the refectory, which still survives out of this picture to the left with the Last Supper on its back wall. I say it survives, but in World War II it was almost entirely destroyed except for the wall with this painting on it. An art historical miracle, if there ever was one. Here you can see the way the Last Supper looks, but we'll see better pictures of it in a few minutes. Most tourists are surprised at how big it is, some 20 feet or so wide, with figures that are essentially life-size. Leonardo began work here about 1495, and the picture was finished at the latest by 1499 when he left Milan. Matteo Bandello, the Italian raconteur who was in Milan at the time and watched Leonardo at work, says that on some days he would paint all day long, while on others he would just look at the picture, maybe paint a couple of brush strokes, and then go fix the plumbing or something. This seems interesting in light of what I mentioned earlier about Leonardo only working when he felt the inspiration. No inspiration, no work. He used a mixture of media, including oil, which proved really a disaster. The climate of Milan is not congenial even to the usual water-based fresco, and Leonardo's picture began to show signs of deterioration almost immediately, and it's been touched up and restored countless times in the past 500 years. We'll hear more about this in a bit, too. Before we take a closer look at Leonardo's Last Supper, I want to show you some other 15th century versions of this subject. This Last Supper is in the Church of San Apollonia in Florence and was painted by Andrea del Castagno about 1445. You may remember the problem that painters had with the halos of the apostles when they were seated on the near side of the table. And this is one of the first versions, although there are other precedents for this uh, going back to the Middle Ages. This is one of the first versions to place everyone, with the exception of Judas who doesn't get a halo, on the far side to avoid this problem. Someone has referred to this picture as the supper on the subway because of the sort of railway car look of Del Castaño's set made to accommodate this arrangement. Dra the dramatic marble decoration on the wall draws attention to Jesus and Judas who are not in the center of the picture. The apostles are represented here as a sort of tableau of independent figures without much interaction, and there's an atmosphere of contemplation rather than drama, which is typical in pre-Leonardo versions. Here's Ghirlandaio's version, painted about 1480 in the former refectory at Ognissanti in Florence. Here, dinner's taking place in a kind of loggia with a garden outside, and again, the atmosphere is one of serenity and tranquility, appropriate to a monastery dining room. And a similar version now by Ghirlandaio in the refectory at San Marco, and in very good shape, whether or not Bernard Berenson is correct in saying Ghirlandaio didn't have a spark of genius, he had the fresco technique down pat. According to the inscription, Jesus has just spoken the lines in which he says, in effect, My Father has provided a mansion in heaven where we'll all have dinner again someday. And again, everyone is quiet and calm, withdrawn into his own thoughts. This is pure 15th century Renaissance serenity. Now try to hold this in your mind's eye as we look closer now at Leonardo's version. <laughs> 
Now Jesus has just spoken the words, one of you shall betray me, and this produces something altogether different. The apostles gesture, turn to one another. Some actually jump to their feet, while Judas, now also on the same side of the table to the left of Christ from our viewpoint, recoils from him. Only Jesus remains as calm as a pyramid. Instead of an unmoving contemplative tableau of individuals, we now have something with much more unity of effect and, of course, drama that again foreshadows the emotional art of the Baroque a century ahead. As I mentioned earlier, the painting started to deteriorate almost at once. When Vasari saw it in 1556, he described it as a muddle of blots, and subsequent observers make similar comments. It also hasn't always been treated with quite the reverence we give it today. In the 18th century, the monks cut a door through the lower part of it so they could have easier access to the kitchen. After World War II, when the refectory was rebuilt, the Last Supper was restored, and as late as 1970 was being described as being as close to the original as it could ever be brought, and then in 1978, a whole new restoration was undertaken, the purpose of which, like the post-World War II work, was to remove everything but what Leonardo originally put on the wall. This took about 20 years and reduced some of the faces to little more than silhouettes. Whether we really now see the actual paint Leonardo applied, however, is still argued about. Shortly after Leonardo finished The Last Supper, a pupil of his named Gian Pietrino, made a full-size copy on canvas. It's now in the Royal Academy of Art in London and was used as a major source during the last restoration, so at least we know pretty much what the original was like. We're going to see some parts of The Last Supper up closer now, these will be pictures taken after the latest restoration. And we're going to hear a motet called Two Solus Creator by Josquin Dupre, who, as I've said, was the greatest composer in Europe around 1500. You may remember that he began his career in Milan back in the days of Ludovico's father, Francesco Sforza. He was in Milan on and off then until about 1479, and since Leonardo didn't arrive there till 1482, they may never have met. But this motet is something he wrote while he was in Milan, so Leonardo might have heard it there sometime. Right to left are John, Peter, and Judas. <laughs> Since the last restoration, that's Philip now at the right, with James the Greater not pointing, but saying, in effect, one of us will betray you. <laughs> 
Although there are only a dozen or so pictures which everyone thinks are wholly by Leonardo, two of them, The Last Supper and the Mona Lisa, are among the most important ever painted and are probably the two most well-known works of art in history. Based on his reading of what Leonardo wrote, Kenneth Clark says that Leonardo was in no accepted sense a Christian, but what about on the basis of what he painted? That should count for something. Unfortunately, I guess, Leonardo spent much more of his time in Milan, as I've said, on the ephemeral and the trivial than he did on things like the Last Supper. This is part of the decoration which he, and some assistants, I hope, painted to decorate a room in the Castello Sforcesco, which Ludovico wanted to make look sort of like an outdoor garden. The restoration of this was begun in 1965. This restoration, however, amounted in part, at least, to a complete repainting of at least certain areas, as I can attest from seeing it being done in 1977. The one thing that seems to indicate Leonardo's presence here is the bronze-colored ribbon, or whatever it is, which winds through the foliage, looping back on itself over and over to create the look of that pinstriping we saw in the dresses in the early portraits attributed to him. Someone has argued that this is, or at one time was, actually one continuous ribbon, although it doesn't look like it. I assume Leonardo put this ribbon in just to break up the monotony of painting thousands of leaves, if, if that's what he did here. He was working on this at the same time he was painting The Last Supper, and I wouldn't be surprised if he actually spent more time on it. One of the things Leonardo made sure to mention in his resume was the fact that he could cast an equestrian monument in bronze to honor Ludovico's father Francesco. This is a sketch which probably indicates the sort of thing he had in mind, and he did go so far as to make a full-scale plaster and clay model, but the bronze which had been gotten ready had to be used for cannons instead when news came that the French were on the move toward Milan under Louis XII in 1499. We'll hear more about the invasion shortly, but the French soldiers in Milan also used the model Leonardo had made for target practice, so nothing ever came of it. Some think the French may actually have saved Leonardo from certain failure. The monument was supposed to be 23 feet high and would have weighed 80 tons. I'm not sure anything even half that size had ever been cast before. A few years ago, an American, vowing to complete the job, cast a big bronze horse with no rider that looks like nothing Leonardo ever drew. It was greeted with no enthusiasm whatever in Milan and is now apparently on display in the parking lot of a shopping center. From the time he arrived in Milan on, Leonardo rode and drew on page after page in notebooks, and some 8,000 of these pages survived. The former New York Times critic John Kennedy went so far as to say that if he had to choose between keeping the paintings or the notebooks, he'd keep the notebooks. The most important collection is the Codex Atlantico in the Ambrosian Library in Milan, which has about half the surviving pages, but there are also large collections at Windsor Castle, the Institut de France, the Madrid Royal Library, and there are smaller collections elsewhere. Because of the lack of organization, Because Leonardo lacked what he calls the synthetic faculty, Kenneth Clark says the notebooks remind him of the proverbial Chinese exam on which you're just supposed to write down everything you know. This drawing now in the Venice Academy is usually called divine proportion and it's one of the ones most commonly reproduced in this, from this pen and ink record of the intellectual adventures in the life of the man Sir Kenneth calls the most relentlessly curious man in history. 
I think, in fact, that it's a self-portrait. What better model to use than himself, after all? It also bears an unmistakable resemblance to the red chalk portrait we'll see later, which at least some think might be a self-portrait, and to another drawing which I think may also be a self-portrait. Okay, that's where we'll take the break, and we'll go on with the notebooks when you're ready.